Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. That coffee is kicking in. That's great. So I, I'm going to be, um, I, I think I was invited to give this talk because of some work that, a body work that I did back, what, what's now sort of going on 10, ten years ago, in the, in the mid-2000s and, and, and up, to, up to the late 2000s, looking specifically at the issues related to <coughs> land use, new development and, and laws that states were putting in, in place about water supply adequacy. And, and that's been kind of the hot button topic in a lot of communities in the West, sort of, is there enough water for growth and how do you sure for that and, and everything. And so I'm going to definitely talk about some of that, but you'll, you'll also have to, I'm sure that some of you in the room know, the, know more recent details about some of the examples than I do because I haven't followed it as closely in in other states in, in, the, in the very recent time. But I'm also going to talk a little bit more broadly about other land use issues that are, that are linked to water that I think are, are people are becoming more and more aware of and, and that it, or, or ought to become more aware of um, for, for thinking about policy. So first, just a, a little background to, to sort of the why, why this is even an issue of sort of thinking about land use when you're thinking about, about water. And, and you know a lot of the a lot of the issues relate to water quantity. Now, what I just mentioned in terms of a, enough water for growth, that's really related to the idea of water scarcity, which is a lot of what we've been talking about in this conference. And so, making sure there's enough water available for to protect and support. I'm saying here long-term investments because I think that that's relevant not just for development, um, residential development. It's also relevant for uh, non-farm business development, and it's increasingly, as people are realizing in, in, in the orchard areas of California, for example, it's, it's important if you've got long-term field investments as well. Um, and then the other, the other, the flip side of this, which is also really important in, you know, across the U.S., but in the West, for sure, as well, is, is not, is what happens if you have too much water and not putting people and investments in, in harm's way for that. So land use planning around around flood management, which is something that we sort of do in the U.S., but and I'll touch on that a little bit towards the end, um, how we could do better. And then, and then a, a thing that um, people have been kind of realizing also more recently is the fact that the land is permeable in some places and, and you want to be able to get that water into the ground, so how you, how, how you develop Depend, it can affect whether you're able to, to recharge groundwater. Then there's also a whole water quality dimension, and I'm not going to, I don't have detailed slides to, to talk about that, but I'm happy to talk about it um, during, the, during the discussion time, which is thinking about drainage planning in order to not have terrible stormwater and urban one, runoff problems. And Thomas mentioned yesterday the issues related to ag water and land use practices and, and the implications for both for surface water runoff quality but also for groundwater quality. So why does linkage not automatically happen? Why, since these problems are sort of, you would think you'd want, you'd, you'd want to think about that in your land use decisions, but it, it, it doesn't always happen and it's for a few different reasons. One of them is just even when we have planning laws, the, 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 there's usually a separation of responsibilities. So, um, you know, in California, the big discussion about water supply availab availability for development was around the fact that, you know, the cities and counties are the ones that approve development, but it was, we have, in our case, a lot, often we'll have special districts that are separate governments that are providing the water, or in some cases, privately owned utilities, and without a requirement that they link up, uh, there was a, an issue of cities just in some cases, at least rogue, rogue counties, I think especially, approving development and just assuming that the local water agency would annex the area and provide the water, no problem. What, we, what I found in research, uh, researching this is that you know, this, is, this can even be an issue when you've got a municipal water department and you've got your you know, land use guys, your planning, planning commission department they don't necessarily even talk to each other, even though they're all under the same mayor. So, so that's an issue of just coordination in planning. Another one, and this is one that both is sort of a political science and an economics question, is is the the sort of what we uh, economics economists would call market failures related to just the different time horizons of 
of the people that are making some decisions and, and the fact that the people that are buying the housing, for example, don't have full information about whether or not there's water available. Um, so, you know, the, the classic case of this is the dry lot developments out in rural areas that look really nice and the developer sells you um, a lot and it has nothing, you know, there's no groundwater there to speak of and uh, other services might be lacking as well. This has been, a, that was one of the early concerns in certain western states was preventing that kind of, of dry lot development where the, the evil developer would scam people. Um, but, but there are also reasons to think that sometimes municipal leaders don't have the longer term interests of the community um, in, in, in top of mind either if they are under political pressure from the folks who support their campaigns who happen to be developers. Um, and, and in the case, you know, the developers are, once they sell the land and, and, and ha have the, you know, hand over the keys, the, the problem goes away for them and it, because they don't have a, a, a long-term stake in, in, in the community. So that, that issue is also a reason to sort of intervene with regulations. I will say that many municipalities do plan ahead on some of these issues and, and the example that I that, that I find in most impressive is on the on Colorado's Front Range, where they realized I back, I guess when the Two Forks Dam was not going to happen, that they had to stop imagining that they were going to just easily get more water from the, the other side of the Continental Divide, and started putting in place requirements that new development had to either come with cash or come with water. And that was, not a, that was not a state law. That was just a decision made by the, by the utilities and the municipalities. And um, it, 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 what I found in the mid-2000s was that that meant that that was some of the most expensive water-related um, development that, that you, could see, you could find across, across different Western states in the sense of sort of what was the incremental cost to a new house of bringing that water. Um, often that involved you know, purchasing water, but sometimes it involved just paying for the the utility to do it. Anyway, so that, that just to say it's not that municipalities can do it and often do do it. In California, we found that that was also the case. But but you do have also cases, or, you know, big big challenges where there's not a lot of good oversight. And, and that is, you know, especially in rural communities where even if county um, officials are supposed to be keeping an eye on that, the western counties are big these communities are spread out, it's really, you, you can't, it's hard to expect them to be the watchdog in all of this um, on their own. And then it's also been a big problem in open, up, open access groundwater basins. And I would suggest that the, you know, Arizona has some of the, in some ways, most rigorous laws on assuring water supply for new development in the, in the active management areas. In part, that was an outgrowth of deciding that Arizona had to manage its groundwater. And so, um, you know, the, the sort of fear that water was going to be, become short because everybody was mining the groundwater basin, so that came in as, a, as part of a sort of package of things in the wake of the, the 1980 groundwater law. So, and this, this is an issue in California um, now too, obviously, and one of the things that's led up to the, I think, supported the adoption of the law that Thomas talked about yesterday. Okay, so scan of the big issues. Water supply adequacy for new development. I'm going to go through a little bit of what, uh, the research findings on that, and then I'm going to talk about some of these other um, issues that are listed below. So, most Western states have some form of state level requirement for of proving up water supply adequacy for new development. Uh, a paper that Margaret Brown and I did back in in the mid 2000s looked in, in depth at five states. So this lists them there. And this just gives you a sense here of sort of when the laws came in and the kinds of the kinds of reach that they have. Um, California, California's law was really big in the news at the time that we did this work, because in 2001 a, a law was passed saying that you had to. Actually, there was one in '95 that didn't really get implemented, so they came back in again with a little bit more teeth in 2001 saying that big projects had to, had to show that they had at least 20 years of water supply. Um, and that was v v big being 500 units or more, or 
um, if in a smaller community, that something that was going to increase water use by 10% or more. And, and at the time, people looked at that and said, that's too big of a, you know, 500 is a lot of houses. What about 499? That's going to still be a lot of houses, and that's not under the law. Um, they also were, were concerned that it was just 20 years, whereas, say, Arizona, it's a 100-year water supply that you have to provide. Um, but you know th those those are the kind of debates you get you get different flavors of things in, in Colorado and and in New Mexico the state entered really in mainly just to worry about unincorporated areas and what could uh, specifically in relation to the use of groundwater um, in, in these areas and making sure that there was some reasonable oversight of of how that was going to be used and in, in some cases how it was going to be mined because in some cases this is using basins that essentially don't recharge for, or in, 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 maybe in geologic time they do, but not in, not in the time frame of, of when we think about housing. So, um, you know, a, a number of, Arizona's first law was actually back in 73, just as Colorado's um, in 72, those, those were really initially about these dry lot development kind of concerns and making sure people didn't get scammed. So, you think about, you know, states have these laws in some places. Some lo local agencies have these laws as well. Um, how, do, how do developers comply with this? And, and you see a, a range of different ways to comply. Um, if you're building within a municipal service area, some of your options are buying water rights. That's been a very popular thing in Colorado, and that's been the thing that has led to the cries and concerns about what's um, known as buy and dry. And I've got a picture for you of buy and dry here. That is, um, and now I can't remember exactly where in Colorado, but that, that was taken by um, a, a, a woman from EDF in, in Colorado who's working on, uh, as part of the Colorado Water Plan, and it just kind of shows you in Colorado the way the, the transfer law is set up you got to prove that you've got the water by saying you're not going to you're not going to touch it uh, anymore with irrigation, and so that really does dry up the, the land. What people are now looking at are some options like rotational fallowing, where you get the same amount of water, but you can kind of move that move it around. We talked about the Palo Verde deal yesterday when when Adam was was presenting his talk. That's an alternative. Um, other options, paying for water system development. This is this is I would say probably the most common thing, and it's become now just really sort of part and parcel of the way a lot of utilities work, which is that in the old days there used to be a meter fee for just installing, you know, running the pipe to the house kind of thing and, and, and setting up a meter. Now many places, and this really started with Colorado, but now in California they do it quite a bit now too, and in other places, have a, a fee that basically takes care of the, the incremental costs in some way of adding you to the system. Um, and so that may be the equivalent of buying some water. It may be just sort of part of a cost of a project that's in the pipeline for the utility. And that can, that can range you know, from anywhere from a couple grand to over $10,000 per house. And it's, it's, going, it's going up. Um, another option that you see in some places is paying to retrofit older homes. This is used in some California communities where the, the existing homes are not plumbed with water efficient appliances and, and devices. And so you pay basically to, to finance that. Often you can do that with businesses too, which is where you can get sort of a quick bang for your buck. And then use that, that, that water savings basically makes it possible for you to, to develop. This is sometimes referred to, what is it, is it water neutral development? I think, yeah. And there, there are some environmental groups in California that have been, every now and then a law kind of gets proposed in, in the legislature to require all development to be water neutral, which <coughs> is crazy because not all communities have that built-in flexibility, especially if they're already water efficient and they're not, you know, it depends on how big you are and all that. But, um, and then um, there's the idea of using less landscaping. Now, I, I've showed you here above, that is also Colorado, that's a, the town of Aurora, which had an interesting set of fees, buy-in fees, where you could either pay full price if you weren't going to have special landscaping restrictions, or you could pay less as a developer if you're going to install the sort of more 
you know, climate climate appropriate uh, kinds of landscaping, and that meant that your footprint was less, and therefore you weren't going <coughs> to cost the system as much incrementally. Um, and I will say that this using less water landscaping is really what we're seeing happening now in the, in the, with the California drought. That's sort of the, the big change that I think we're going to see durably after this drought is people are, utilities are actually paying people, subsidizing people, existing residents to, to tear out their lawns. Um, but we're, we're, we're going to see that that's something I think that developers will also start helping to pay for because the cash for that is, is in high demand. Uh, meter caps, which are just saying, you know, not, can't, can't grow, are, are actually rare, except what, at, from what I've seen at least, except in, in very small communities that are, that are really supply constrained. And then in remote, well-dependent areas, this is where you get into sort of creative ways of, of, of managing this. One of them is, is limiting housing by having minimum acreage uh, requirements. And uh, Colorado has this in various places where it's got, I don't know if it's like 35 acres or something. It's some very large plots that um, basically limit density. And then, or water rationing. And that can be, um, th that is most easily observed by just saying no landscaping outdoors. You have that in, in some places in New Mexico, for example, and I think in some places in Colorado. Okay, how's it working? So this is uh, some more detailed research that we did on both on California and then in Colorado and New Mexico looking at sort of statistical analysis about, about, about how this is working as well as informed by, by some interviews. So in California, you know, I, I mentioned that a lot of people were concerned about the loopholes and the, the potential, you know, the 500 units, was that too big? Um, it's 20 years too little. And and I I'm, I actually think those laws are working pretty pretty well. Um, for one, the state does not preempt state law doesn't preempt strict or local action. And a lot of places already had policies in place, so it's really more of a safety net and kind of catching the rogue communities rather than something that has just had to radically transform behavior on the part of of what what locals were doing. Um, rare, the laws. The application law rarely blocks development, but it does sometimes re re result in downsizing of projects. What it does do is encourage negotiations with developers about more conservation, about using recycled water, sort of the kinds of things that go beyond code um, in the in the the developments that they're planning. And then what's what's also interesting is a, a related uh, water planning law in, in California that that's helping, which is a, a law that requires all urban utilities of a certain size to to do fi every five years, they have to update their long-term plan for water supply demand under various kinds of scenarios. And you, if you fold in new development of certain types into that plan, that that qualifies. That 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 can be just the way that you're you're showing it's available. So, in some ways, it's it's just explicitly encouraging the utilities to be thinking about that. And I, you know, there are ways in which that can still improve. But I think it's you know. It's it's pretty good work in progress. What what we looked at in Colorado and New Mexico were specifically how the state restrictions on development in the unincorporated areas were were working, and and what we found was that um, th they were definitely shifting some new development to the incorporated the municipal service areas, which arguably is a good thing if you're worried about you know having sort of. On unmanaged development and use of mining of groundwater in the outlying areas, it probably has some other benefits too, um, from a, a other infrastructure perspective. We did also find that there, you know, there's a concern. Most of these laws have loopholes for domestic wells as opposed to com community water systems, and in Colorado, it looked like the domestic well loophole was actually also working and encouraging off-grid development to some extent. Uh, on balance, there was more going into municipal service areas than the off-grid, but, but definitely also some of that. So now on to other issues. Um, what I've listed up here is agricultural land use, groundwater recharge that I already touched on a little bit, thinking about upper watershed health and forest management that, that got mentioned a bit yesterday, and then, and then floodplain management. So agriculture. And I think Reagan, you showed a, is, I don't know if, is Reagan still here? It showed a, yesterday a, a chart um, with some big, big bars on it in different Western states of the, the size of agricultural water use relative to urban. You know, all, everything I've been talking about has been about 
expanding urban water use and is there enough water available for that and you know yes urban, the western population has been growing and uh, to some extent urban water use has been going up although in a lot of places actually because of conservation the total amount of urban use hasn't really been going up uh, very much if at all agriculture is still the predominant user of water if we count you know water used by people directly um, and so if we're thinking about water scarcity issues, it's just very hard to imagine that ag is not going to be a part of getting hit by, by water scarcity. Um, but that's why I, I am calling it the Willie Sutton problem because that's where the that's where the water is. And I just heard Buzz the other day. So you you know, in California, anytime you go to a water talk practical water event, somebody will pull out the Mark Twain quote about whiskey's for drinking and water's for fighting, and then there's a discussion of did he really say it, there's no evidence that he said it. Well, apparently there's no evidence that Willie Sutton said that's where the money is in, the, in answer to the question, why do you rob banks? So I don't know. I mean, maybe maybe these guys are kindred spirits, Willie Sutton and, <laughs> and Mark Twain, but um, but yeah, this is where the water is, and so so there's there's, there's bound to be some need to, to, to think about ag land use in relation to, to water management, and our approach to that has largely been to try to get them the water that they need. And you know, if you think about federal policy, and um, you know, try to sort of cushion them with crop insurance and and uh, subsidies for for feed when when there's a drought. But I, I'm going to suggest that we need to think about land use um, as well, rather than just kind of. Picking up pieces after after individual farms deci farmers decisions that that don't result in in the best overall outcomes. So so you know a few a few things to think about in terms of how planning can possibly yield better outcomes than the sort of less fair approach to, to ag land use. Um, the buy and dry uh, versus versus rotational following example from from Colorado that has everybody really you know sort of. Concern there is, is an example of that because if if you're going to do rotational following, you'd have to have some sort of a plan and, and a collective sort of way that you're going to do it. I think one of the things that people have been upset about is the fact that it, the buy and dry happen in a kind of atomistic way, and it leads to outcomes that are not as good necessarily for the overall community. Um, I think you know also thinking in California now about with water scarcity. In, especially in places that are going to have to reduce total water use it, because of the groundwater law down in the San Joaquin Valley, which is almond and pistachio capital of the, of the world, um, people are, are worried about what that means for what, how you manage water scarcity for permanent crops. And Doug, Doug showed us some nice pictures of beautiful uh, flowering almond trees um, yesterday. So you know this is also an issue where planning is relevant. I will tell you that when the new groundwater law was in draft, um, there was a clause in there that said that local governments could do the same kinds of things that that they they do now they have to do now for new development in terms of approvals. It was going to give them authority and actually ask them to to do that for permanent cropping. Counties and cities scream bloody murder, and that that left the law. I actually am fine with that because I'm I, I kind of get nervous when we try to micromanage and zone land use for different kinds of, of agriculture based on based on that. I would much rather just have us have everybody know how much water do they have access to um, sustainably, and then figure out how to how to manage that collectively um, rather than sort of deciding exactly where, where trees can go. But I do think that that's going to result in, in the need for long-term trading arrangements. Because yes, I think, Doug, you were suggesting, you know, farmers on their own can think about what's the balance between tree crops and, and, and field crops. But to some extent, you really want, you want the flexibility to not have that all be done on farm and to be able to do that across, across farms. So that also requires some kinds of coordination planning. And then I mean, what I'm showing you here is, is the, the issue of sort of managing retirement with salinity, um, which is something that it is happening in, in California over time just because of, of just the, the mix of the, the water quality that we have and the kinds of soils. So, so as, as, think, as one thinks about land retirement, 
you can think about, you know, farmers will do it until, farmers will, will not retire until it's really not earning money for them anymore. And by the, t by the time they do that, it, you may have trashed it enough that it's not good for habitat either. And so thinking about programs that involve strategic early retirement, maybe with some compensation, uh, in, in order to be able to have some habitat connectivity. So this is one of my new favorite critters. This is the San Joaquin kit fox. And there is actually a program, um, I don't know how many people are enrolled in it, to, to, where you can do some early land retirement in support of that kind of habitat. Um, another consideration is how to use ag land beneficially for environmental purposes. And sometimes that happens just on its own. So um, f rice farmers in the S Sacramento Valley flood their fields to break down rice straw in the, in the fall. And that's great wetland habitat for birds. But when you've got a drought, you, you don't have as many rice fields and you don't have extra water necessarily to do that. So um, one of the things that was very helpful during this drought uh, in terms of water bird and wetland management for the Pacific Flyway was paying farmers. And I'm looking over at Noel because NRCS was involved in this um, as well as the Nature Conservancy with some philanthropic dollars. And I think this is the kind of thing that is, is really potentially a, a great tool and 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 where, there's, where there are some USDA dollars that could, that could help with this. Um, okay, groundwater recharge. So I, I can't remember if Thomas showed a map of this. He certainly talked about recharge issues. This is a map that was recently done by, by some folks at UC Davis that, that Thomas works with. I think he may have been on this team as well. And what they were doing was looking at ag land and recharge potential based on the, the, the quality of the soils. And just because it might be hard to read from back there, red and, and dark orange are not good. Um, so excellent is green, good is sort of light green, you know, yellow is still okay. Um, what it shows you is that even though this, you know, this is one, this Central Valley here, this is one big basin and, you know, in, at some, to some extent, you know, at the, the sort of the NASA view of it is that one big basin, but, um, it, it varies as to where you where you can put your put water and get it into the ground easily, and so that that's not the only way you can recharge. You can also recharge passively, but if you want to actively recharge, you have to to think about this. And and I'm I'm showing you here a couple of photos that are that are very relevant right now in in the San Joaquin Valley. This may not be the exact parking lot, but when I when I was there um, when I was in Fresno for for an event. Back in the summer, we were talking about groundwater recharge, which is just all the buzz now that the people have to manage groundwater. And um, some folks pointed out the parking lot of a big box, and I'm not sure if it was Clovis or Fresno, you know, right, right in that area, that was like the best, it would have been bright green. You know, it was like the best recharge area in the, in, in the locality, but sadly had been paved over because nobody was thinking about that at the time that they were doing that kind of land use planning. And, and similar issue, so that's an urban uh, development issue, but, but it's a, there's a similar issue now with tree crops. So this is a, a flooded um, field of vines. I think it's from Don Cameron's farm, who's a, a, a grower who's on the state food, food and ag board, a grower from down in, in the Fresno area, who's been one of the folks who's been experimenting with you know, this conundrum that we have, okay, now down in, in the San Joaquin Valley, over almost half of the acreage is now tree crops. Most of that is now planted to drip and subsurface irrigation. Um, you know, super efficient. Uh, some of them are getting 95% irrigation efficiency. Um, so it's not the flood irrigation that you, you know, used to, used to be able to recharge the groundwater basin. So now what do you do? How do you kind of still get water into the ground in good places? And what they're experimenting with and finding, getting good results with, is that for certain deciduous trees and, you know, vines and, and almonds and, and certain other fruit trees, you can, you can let them sit in water for a while um, in, the, in the winter and spring and recharge the ground. So now the, the, it, the question is sort of really managing this in relation to water quality and, and so on and kind of looking for optimal yield issues. But it's a really promising area, I think, that, that also requires some, some, some planning. And it's also where I think USDA funding can help. Um, okay, forests and upper watersheds. Um, the, this this came up yesterday. I think it, when it, during Reagan's talk, this is a this is one of those 
water and drought issues in the West that doesn't get talked about. It doesn't usually get thought about as a, as a water and drought issue. And I'll say it's not just a water issue. It's, it's, it's really, it really is a drought issue and a climate, climate warming issue um, combined with the fact that we've just been managing our forests in ways that have made them very unhealthy. So, you know, a typical Western um, conifer forest is about four times denser than healthy forests would be. And that's because we've not been allowing small fires to happen. We've been putting them out, and partly because of development pressures and not wanting to, you know, encroach on, on cabins and things like that. Partly because of policies about wilderness areas and things. And um, so, so everybody recognizes this. I think at this point that this is a, a problem, and and in some ways the the, the recent. You know the, the past 15 years of, of Western drought and just the mega fires that we've we've been getting have helped to kind of focus things. And I think this is sounds like an area where there may be potential for bipartisan action in, in Congress um, to to get some changes to to make more money available for forest management because right now a lot of the budget is being eaten up by just putting out the, the or, or fighting the very big fires. There are a lot of reasons to do this, air quality, infrastructure safety, habitat, um, but also water quality and water supply. Now, that's not alone going to be enough to pay for it, but it's an important consideration for, for a lot of, of water managers too. And so it's, it, water utilities and their customers should be able to help pay for this. And this is, this is another area where the, the federal role is just tremendous. Um, I think maybe there was a... a a slide talking about this yesterday as well. This this just shows you, west uh, in, in the eleven westernmost states, the the federal land footprint, um, and the, so that sort of aqua blue is is Bureau of Land Management. The dark blue is the Forest Service, and the the green is is the Park Service, most of which is also forested area. So, you know, on, on average here, about almost half of the of total land and much more of that in the upper watersheds. Um, finally, just before wrapping up, flood risks are high and, and likely rising with climate change. The, the expectation, at least in some parts of the West, is, is, is more heat, more variability. And so to the extent that we're going to be lucky to get... Well, to get precipitation, it's likely to be coming in bigger spikes, and and that means greater likelihood of of, of flooding. Um, also, in places that are dependent on snow melt, just the the melting of that snow is is going to make flood management a bigger challenge. And the or the the fact that a lot of that's coming as rain instead of snow is going to make the flood management a bigger challenge. Just to sort of bring home the droughts and floods. As, as partners in, in the weather system. Um, this is Texas. I don't know what town. Maybe somebody can recognize that for me, but just after, you know, they were, they were really high on it. They were bright red, I think, or at least orange on the flood map until, until they got hit with, with some massive floods this year, earlier this year. Um, the U.S. has a land use policy on this related to the National Flood Insurance Program, but it's it's pretty minimalist compared to what pretty much any expert that looks at this says that we ought to have, and um, you know just basically tries to keep development out of harm's way for 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 some of the the biggest uh, some of the really big and big and frequent floods, and and that the policies and those maps don't tend to take into account changing hydrology. So um, th there, I think there's there's room. California actually has adopted a law that doubles the required level of protection to a 200-year flood in, in some of the most flood-prone areas of the Central Valley, um, which is as an, as an example that you can go beyond what the, what the feds are, are, are doing with, with, with state laws. And I think that that's a, that's a useful approach. And I'm going to wrap up there. This is, this is actually from the, I think, from the early 90s drought, not from the latest drought. Um, but we, you could actually come and you don't have to bring your own water. We have some for you. <laughs> Thank you.